He joined the New York Times in 1988, writing on the beginnings of the World Wide Web, the capture of hacker Kevin Mitnick, the shift to wireless, the impact of semiconductors, the drawbacks of Apple's business practices garnering a, garnering a Pulitzer Prize, and most recently, robots. He has transformed many of these subjects into books, including Takedown, sparking controversies in multiple films on Mitnick, what the Dormouse said, detailing the connection between the personal computer and culture of the 60s, and what we're here for today, Machines of Loving Grace, the quest for common ground between humans and robots, examining the future of artificial intelligence and begging us to ask, how much longer will we allow robots to take over our jobs? Growing up next to Larry Page's house and down the street from Steve Jobs, he followed the same path as myself, attending Jordan and Pally. And while he didn't work for the Campanile, as he was too busy racing bikes, the beginnings of his esteemed journalism career sprouted as the editor of Jordan Middle School's Dolphin Daily. He has come to speak to the Campanile on multiple occasions, so when the uh, time came for an individual to be chosen to kick off this season of the Great Mind series, he was at the top of our students list. So without further ado, would you all please join me in welcoming John Mark. So thanks very much for coming. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I've basically sort of writ large, written about two stories in my career, which has started in 1977 uh, here in the Bay Area. And, uh, you know, the first thing I did was cover the rise of personal computing and then uh, the rise of the internet. And uh, then the second story is really um, AI and robotics, which uh, I've sort of uh, made the bet that they're going to have the same impact on society that personal computing and the internet did. They're going to transform society as thoroughly, maybe in the next decade or two decades, as the PC and the internet did uh, in, in, the, in the period before that. Uh, you know, so first, the, the title of the book, I grew up in the 1960s. Um, Richard Brodigan was a wonderful poet in college, and I read a lot of Brodigan, but I actually did not discover the poem, All Watched Over by Machines of Love and Grace, until I, I was here in Silicon Valley in the 1980s when personal computing took off. And it was very evocative for me, which is why I chose the, the title of this book, of sort of the choice that we have about uh, designing ourselves into or out of uh, these systems that we're building. Uh, and I, you know, I've tried very hard, actually, to figure out why it is that uh, Richard Brodigan, who was sort of this transition point between the beat and the hippie era in San Francisco, how he would have stumbled across this notion. If you read the poem, it's very evocative of sort of where we are today, and it, pressing it even. And the closest I've been able to come in terms of, of sort of what motivated Brodigan is that in the spring of 1967, he became the poet in residence at Caltech for 10 days. And in those 10 days, um, something must have struck him uh, because he came, came away and, and wrote this poem. The one thing that I've seen reported is that he spent an afternoon with Richard Feynman, um, the, the Nobel laureate physicist, and maybe it was something who, who actually focused a lot on computing physics. So um, before I start, just uh, you know, a little bit more, Misha probably told you all you need to know about my, my background, but I can't resist since I'm here in Palo Alto. Um, if you look at that, that picture, of that redwood tree in the back is the back of my parents' house on California Avenue. And this, of course, is on Waverly Oaks. And this is the gateway to the Delamus Hacienda, which is this wonderful hidden building in the middle of the blocks, which is surrounded by Waverly and, and Bryant and Santa Rita and uh, on California Avenue. And of course, a number of years ago, it was bought by Larry Page. And, uh, but if you haven't gone into Waverly Oaks, you really should go back to this. It's sort of the most hidden bit, bit of history in Palo Alto. This is where the Padres camp, when they came up, uh, El, Cam El Camino Real, I think in 17 something. And there are three of the original uh, Adobe tiles that are still there. And it's, it's just wonderful lost history. But um, this is my paper route in Palo Alto. I was a paper, a paper boy for the Palo Alto Times. Um, and I was a paper boy both at the house of Larry lives now in the house that Steve used to live. And that's, that's my, my family's house where we used to own at 375 North California. I mean, just one little historic note that you might enjoy. When my dad died in 1995, I saw the papers about the house. And in 1951, he bought the property for $3,000 and he built the house for $18,000. 
My dad was not an architect, but that was the house we grew up in. Uh, so, you know, I sort of got drawn into this changing world of robots. And what brought me in really was uh, something that uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency began doing in, uh, in 2000, 2004. Uh, they began holding a series of contests because the, the, uh, the Congress had, had told the Pentagon that they needed to have a third of the nation's land vehicles be autonomous by 2015, that's this year. And they weren't making it, this was in 2000. And so the director of this organization called DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, decided he was gonna speed things up. Um, he wasn't getting what he wanted out of the military industrial complex, and so he thought he'd bring in random people like university professors and hackers, and he opened this contest to everybody. And they had these three contests called the Grand Challenge events um, in, in uh, Southern California and Arizona. And uh, out of it came this remarkable advance. And at the second one, Andy Rubin, who was the person who would later build uh, Google's robot division, which is just over here on California Avenue, um, said this to me. And I didn't get it for about three or four years, you know, PCs sprouting legs. But at a certain point, it sort of dawns on you that these machines that were in cages before um, are starting to move around in the world. And what, what struck me really is, uh, I think most clearly, was I think in 2012, I was away from the paper and I was, I was working out at the Center for Advanced Study for Behavioral Sciences behind the Stanford campus where I had an office to work on this book. And uh, Koopa Cafe you know, has a place up by the golf course. And one morning I drove up to Koopa Cafe for breakfast and uh, I parked my car and this woman drove up next to me in a Tesla. And uh, she got up and she set up her golf, her golf cart and she walked off and the golf cart followed her. And I just looked, the first time you see something like this, your jaw drops, you can't imagine. But I managed to pull my iPhone out of my pocket and I got this Yeti-like picture, that's the golf cart following her. And so then I immediately, um, after that went and uh, you know you Google anything, and I realized um, you know it's on the internet. This, this is this is like being in fries. Anybody can get one. It's not down to fourteen hundred dollars. And the only question was when the batteries last for eighteen volts. But um, you know the robots are out of are, are really out of their cages and they're starting to move around in the world. And it's, it's this different time. And it, 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 and that's what I've been trying to report on since, since 2004. Um, when, when, I, when I wrote my last book, um, again, which was a study of things that happened right around Stanford campus between 1965 and 1975, it was kind of an anti-autobiography. Um, I was trying to figure out, you know, I graduated from Palo in 67, I went away for a decade, and I came back and there was this world-changing industry, and I was really curious about what happened while I was gone. And if you looked at this really sort of small area of the world, um, personal computing and the internet basically emerged here during a really intense decade period. I was trying to understand that. And one of the things I noticed that uh, beginning in 1962, which is when interactive computing sort of began in the world, there, was, there were two laboratories on either side of the Stanford campus. And one of them was started by John McCarthy, this man. And uh, in 62, he thought that you could build a machine to replace uh, the human, basically an AI, and it would take you a decade. That's the, what he wrote in his, his project proposal to the, uh, to the Pentagon. And uh, you know, it's, since then, it's been a constant 10 years. We're always 10 years away from having a working AI. But um, McCarthy was a remarkably interesting man. He, he basically coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956 at this, at this meeting. Uh, in the East Coast, and uh, he was at MIT, and he invented time sharing, he invented the LISP programming language, and then he came out here and built this laboratory. And I think SAIL, the Stanford AI Lab, which used to be on a rest of the road behind Stanford, had this huge impact on the world. And if you're sort of thinking about where modern computing came from, um, you know, one of the threads is stuff started in this other lab. This is Doug Engelbart, who of course you know is the inventor of the mouse, and he also invented hypertext, and a series of technologies that largely became the modern personal computing world and the internet. And you know, at a certain point, the technology left Doug's group, which was called the Augmentation Research Center, and it moved to Xerox Park. And it also left the Stanford AI Lab and moved to Xerox Park, where they formalized it in this machine called the Alto, and then it was borrowed by Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, and we all got to use it as a commercial product. 
But what I realized when I was when I was sort of looking at this, that here on one side of, uh, of the Stanford campus was the Stanford AI lab, uh, building technology to replace humans. On the other side of campus, Doug Engelbart's vision was technology to augment humans. And that was like this philosophically opposite direction that the industry was going right at the start of the, the modern computing era. And in fact, two communities were, compute, that were created. One was the AI community, largely under-delivered under and over-promised for decades after it started. And on the other side of campus was Engelbart's work. And in the early 1960s, he was completely out of fashion. He was seen as an outsider. And the irony is that personal computing and the internet grew directly out of his work, even though he was seen as working on these kind of uh, not serious computer science technologies like word processing and things like that. So, you know, dial the world you know, up to today and you have these two communities that are largely separate. There's the AI community and now that, that Engelbart community is, is generally referred to as the human computer interaction uh, perspective and people who operate in that perspective usually sort of build systems from the human out. So human in the center, human not. And I tried to, in this book, sort of square that circle, to, to look at the sort of the choices that the designers made. And the book is a set of sort of wo interwoven narratives about different researchers making different choices about the relationship between the humans and the machine. I, I just want, since I'm here, I want to take a slight detour uh, because I also deal with some of the early roots of Silicon Valley. And this may be a little bit of history you haven't heard, but I think it's kind of profound. And you know, in talks I've given in the past, I've generally sort of made jokes about uh, the roots of Silicon Valley. Um, I like to say that what, you know, in the answer to the question, why is Silicon Valley here? It's here because William Shockley's mother was here, and Shockley showed up here uh, when he left Bell Labs, and he started Shockley Semiconductor, which begot Fairchild, which begot everybody else. And so it's kind of serendipitous. Um, and also, you know, there are things like the fact that there was this first Justice Department lawsuit in the early 1950s, and out of this lawsuit against, antitrust lawsuit against AT&T, you got the compulsory free licensing of the transistor. If that hadn't have happened, there wouldn't have been a Silicon Valley. But recently, there's a new book, uh, and work done by a um, historian, a man by the name of David Brock, who was working on uh, Gordon Moore's biography. And a, a couple of years ago, he was spending time in the, in the archives looking at Shockley's paper, and he stumbled across something that you know, I had never seen, and nobody had remarked on it. It sort of reframed my whole understanding of Silicon Valley. And, and that is, um, before Shockley left Bell Labs in the early 1950s, he made this impassioned plea inside Bell Labs for them to work on a project. And this is the memo that, that Brock uh, stumbled across. I guess you can't see it because it's cut off at the top, but let's do that. It, basically, he called for people, he called for Bell Labs in 1952 to work on what he called it was an automatic trainable robot. And this is sort of the key, key, the key point. A trainable robot will comprise mind, sensory organs, and a memory in the brain, which, which coordinates the information furnished by the sensory. In principle, the trainable robot problem and limited scope must be to limited. Anyway, so he had it all there in 1952. And the interesting sort of historical point that's been lost is he didn't come to Silicon Valley to build semiconductors and transistors. He came to Silicon Valley with funding from Beckman, who was ultimately the person who, who funded him to, to start Shockley Semiconductor. He wanted Beckman to fund the eye, the machine vision eye for his automatic trainable robot. And so the roots of Silicon Valley are entirely in robotics, which is just, I, I think, remarkably ironic. When Rod Brooks, who started Rethink Robotics, took this battle and passed it around inside his, his company, nobody could date it. It was, it was really that modern. And so let me move from you know the very roots to sort of where we are today. And you know, I, I, the only chart I'll put, and I just wanted to put it on the on the screen so you can see that it flattens out. Because you know, the, the sort of common belief in Silicon Valley is this region of the world was driven by Moore's law, and Moore's law sort of, which is this, um, which is this uh, sort of formula for the doubling of computing power over a long period of time. So two things fall out of Moore's Law. One is that things get faster, faster. But more important, they get cheaper, faster, too. So they're both exponentials. And we've lived off that as an economy for two or three decades, four decades, actually, um, at a very regular point. But, but my point is, it's over. I mean, um, we are now closing in on the end of Moore's Law. And so a lot of the goodness, the sort of the free sort of technological change that we've written on, 
that has created each new generation of technology from mini computers to personal computers to portable computers to smartphones. Um, those things all basically come from free, for free out of, out of Moore's Law. Well, if it slows down, that changes that whole equation. And what's ironic, why I mentioned in this, in, in this context, is that we're at this point um, where Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates and Stuart Russell are all publicly starting to worry about the pace of technology and sort of positing that it's going so fast that we're going to get self-aware machines. This is called the singularity um, in, in a matter of years because, of course, things get faster and faster and they sort of make the leap of faith um, from speed up to automatic intelligence. And my point is, oops, you know, things have sort of slowed down. Um, I still think it's very, it's, it's great that they've raised, raised the points that they've raised, but it may not change the, the, the world in, in the, way, the way they think. So there, there are lots, lots of evidence that suggests that Moore's Law is slowing, it hasn't stopped, um, will we'll go on for another half decade in some way, but maybe at a slower pace, and that sort of changes everything. Um, I may jump back again to the, the very beginning. This is Shaky, and Shaky, of course, was designed uh, about two miles from here at SRI. And Shaky's important. Um, it was seen as a failure uh, at the end of its uh, project life in, in the, the 1970s. It started in the 1960s. It was started by Charlie Rosen, who was uh, a physicist at SRI. He was also one of the families that created Ridge Vineyards, a really interesting man, who sort of took on the project of building uh, an artificial intelligence very, very early on, in the same sense that, um, that John McCarthy did. And he built Shaky as a platform for doing uh, AI research. And out of it came really remarkable stuff. Basically, the navigation stuff you use in your phone has its roots all the way back in Shaky, uh, as does Siri. Uh, Nuance, as a company, grew directly out of the work that was first done, first done on, on Siri. And, uh, you know, uh, Rosen was a very good salesman. He went to the Pentagon and convinced them that they they needed to work on this sentry, this uh, sort of intelligent machine that would be a guard at a military base. And they said, do you think you could carry a gun? He said, oh, two or three, how many do you need? So uh, right from the beginning, um, and, and Shaky was also very controversial because it made it onto the cover of Life magazine in 1970 as the first electronic person, and the reporter got a little carried away, and there's a big debate about the things he asserted that Shaky was doing, such as racing down corridors faster than humans could race and looking in Windows, and apparently the machine was in the shop while he was making these assertions about what it did. Um, so, Bill Duvall um, went to Woodside High School, um, also raced bicycles, uh, and then went away to, to UC Berkeley, took all the computer classes you could take and then dropped out because there was no more computing to take, and he came to SRI. And I, I mentioned Bill um, because he was the first one to cross over. So he started on the Shaky Project shortly after he came uh, to, to work at uh, SRI. And he worked on it for a couple of months, and it was kind of a top-down and militaristic project, and it wasn't so much fun. And he was looking down the hall, and he saw these kind of crazy, long-haired people who were doing this interesting work on augmentation, and he jumped, and he, he crossed over from AI to IA. He went to work for Doug Engelbart, and his group was working on this idea of intelligence augmentation. And Bill was the one um, you know, there was this Watson come here quick moment of the ARPANET, which was the network that was the forerunner for the internet. There was a first message, and Bill was the one who sent it. He sent it on October 29th, 1969. Um, and, uh, and actually, there's sort of a funny story about it. Uh, it wasn't actually an email message. It was actually remotely logging into a computer. Uh, and Doug's software was supposed to be the first sort of killer app for the network. You were supposed to use the network so you could use his software, which think of it as modern, as, as modern person computing, or the forerunner of modern person, from a distance. And so, of course, logging into the computer, you type L-O-G, and on that night, on October 29th, the machine crashed the G. And the reason it crashed was with something called a buffer overflow. A buffer overflow error is one of the security vulnerabilities that is still plaguing the modern computing world today, which is one of the reasons I've given up on covering computer security. It just got too discouraging because it just got worse and worse. I'd written the same story for 40 years and I had to do something else. But, you know, so Bill was the first one to cross over from AI to IA. Another important figure who did the same was a man by the name of Terry Winograd. And Winograd, you might know, as a retired now emeritus professor at Stanford, but 
as a young man, he was a wunderkind at, at uh, MIT AI lab. Uh, in the 1960s, he'd written a program called Shridloo. And Shridloo was a natural language understanding program. And you could basically control, uh, uh, you could give a computer instructions and it would act in your behalf in a virtual environment. And he came out here after that. And he worked on AI for more than a decade, mostly on natural language understanding. And then famously in the early 80s, he walked away, he gave up. He'd been having some conversations with professors at Berkeley like John Searle and Hubert Dreyfus who were very skeptical about the, about the potential for making thinking machines. And at a certain point he walked away and he really moved all the way over to the HCI community. He began working on systems in which humans were at the center. And you know, I think Winograd's a, a good example of the fact that a single human being can have an impact on the world based on their values. He has these very sort of human-centric values. And one of his contributions to the world was convincing Larry Page as his doctoral thesis to do Pedro, rather than doing flying cars or self-driving cars or what have you. Larry worked on PageRank, which led to Google, which I would argue is the most, you know, the most powerful example of an augmentation tool ever invented in human history. Uh, and you know, it, it came pretty much directly from the values that that uh, Terry took away um, from his experience with AI. So, um, similar thread. Um, these are the two architects of, of Siri: um, uh, Tom Gruber and Adam Chire. They met at SRI, they spun out and then famously were bought by Steve Jobs, who in the last year of his, of his life inserted Siri into the Apple interface as a, as a sort of fundamental point of user, user interface for a small device. Both of them were um, sort of inspired to do Siri by a vision video that had been created by John Scully in the 1980s called Mullins Navigator. It became very popular, but it was an example of sort of Sort of, sort of human imagination forcing design. I can't tell you how many times I ran across AI scientists who were inspired by science fiction novels as I was, as I was working on this project, particularly actually Space Odyssey 2001. I can't tell you, I, I ran into more than half a dozen people who wanted to build HAL. That's why they went into AI, which not, was not the reaction I had. Um, so in, in 2004, um, you know, robots were coming out of their cages. This is uh, a car in the, in the, uh, in the first uh, DARPA Grand Challenge. It was a, a Carnegie Mellon team heavily funded by, um, by General Motors. A wonderful, uh, interesting engineer by the name Red Whitaker put this team together and they were, they were favored. They, they came like a military team. But as soon as they started, and there were probably 20 entrants or, or thereabouts, as soon as they started, you could tell that things weren't gonna go exactly <laughs> as planned on one side of the road, this is on the other side of the road. You know, the reality was at that point, the robots were falling, following GPS dots. They weren't doing a lot of, you know, important things like, like seeing the road. And in the end, um, the red team car did better than all the rest. Uh, it was great fun to watch. They made it seven miles before they got a wheel off a road on a mountain road and they spun in the dust and it was all over. And in the end, I flew over in a small plane and, you know, I, it's not a very good picture, but the, the whole desert was covered with dots, like that color dots. Um, my favorite entrant was the, uh, the Berkeley student who designed a gyroscopically stabilized motorcycle. Um, it was a really wonderful device, and it actually worked, except he was so nervous at the starting line, he forgot to turn on the gyroscope. And so it went like that, about 10 feet. So it was considered a huge failure, and the DARPA uh, guy who was behind it, Tony Taylor, was kind of a laughingstock in 2004. But uh, 18 months later, everything changed. This is, of course, the Stanford Stanley, uh, which, uh, which won a $2 million cash prize. Uh, it was all very impressive, probably looked more impressive than it actually was, but it sort of set the world on this direction toward autonomous vehicles. Along the way, there were some bumps in the road. Um, one of the best things that can happen to you as a reporter is to be in a robot crash that you can walk away from. Um, and so this is Sebastian Thrun, who, who uh, led this team and then later started Google X and the Google Self-Driving Car Project. And we were going along a, a, a desert road in Arizona and everything had seemed fine. And the car went over a, a rise and came down into a swale and then the LiDAR, which are those sensors on the front of the car, swept over a branch of a tree. And Sebastian had this big red e-stop button because something went wrong, but the car was off the road before he could hit the e-stop button. And uh, this is really funny because there were two huge 
rock piles on either side of this brush. Well, we ran into the brush, and he straightened out the lighter. Uh, we took off again. There were some other problems that day. Uh, it, was, it was really great fun, but in the end, um, that is a uh, it actually, it was a really exciting race because the red team, the Carnegie Mellon team, was, was winning at this race until about the last 30 or 40 miles, and something broke, and Stanford came running by, and it was too much of a prize. And that led directly to, uh, to Google uh, entering the uh, automotive uh, sort of uh, driving research part of the industry. Uh, the industry. Uh, this was one of my favorite scoops. And, the, the fun part of it is that there have been rumors of uh, Google running self-driving cars on the freeways in Palo Alto, in Palo Alto in, all over California for maybe uh, a half a year uh, ahead of my story that appeared in 2010. And I was poking around and I couldn't really figure things out. I couldn't believe they would be doing this. It must be illegal. Um, I heard that they were driving all the way from San Francisco to Los Angeles. And uh, Sebastian sort of said some things, and it was to some people at an AI conference, I kind of heard about it. But then I was at a Christmas party at uh, a f uh, my cousin's house, and his son said to me, you know, I have this friend who went to Menlo Adler with me, with me, and he's being paid $15 an hour by Google to sit in the car, but he's not driving. I said, oh. And so at that point, I just went over to the Google campus, and the cars were just sitting out in plain view. You didn't even have to do any research. The LiDARs were on top of them. And I think the reason that it took so long for it to come out, because this had been going on for almost a year, um, they also have the Street View cars with the big, tall camera on top. And I think people were having trouble sort of disambiguating LiDAR from camera, and so it took a while. Um, so where are we today? Um, so it's been uh, a half a decade since the self-driving car uh, sort of came out. There, a lot of people think we're very close. And, you know, it, it kind of feels like this sometimes. So when Andy Rubin began to put together um, his Google Robotics division, one of the companies he bought was Boston Dynamics. And it was started by an MIT um, roboticist by the name of Mark Ray Burton. And he's one of the best designers of, of locomotion, uh, robotic locomotion and, and, and walking creatures in, in, in the world. He does spectacular work. And Andy was going around uh, acquiring companies, and the vision that he sort of put before people was um, uh, the Google car would drive up to your house, and the Google robot would jump off the back and run the, run the package up to your house. And you can kind of see that they, it looks like they're on their way. I mean, this is just such impressive stuff. What you don't see is the man with the backpack who's controlling it. So this is an example of teleoperation, and they made great progress um, on it. But it's just the first step. And I, you know, because we're also in here, here he is running up the steps, which is really quite, quite remarkable. But under human control, not autonomously completely. The autonomy is very low, low level. So, you know, DARPA had these three other, con uh, two other contests the DARPA uh, Rescue Robot Challenge that just finished in uh, Los Angeles earlier this year. And the idea was to build a robot that could work in an environment that humans can't. And so um, they were designed to do eight simple tasks, and many of the robots were built by Boston Dynamics. Um, get into a car, drive a car, open a door, turn a valve, uh, throw a switch, walk over uneven ground, and climb stairs. And in fact, three of the robots were able to do what you and I would do in about five minutes, in about 50 minutes. Um, but by and large, it was more of a statement of what we haven't accomplished than what we, we have accomplished. And this is a, 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 a set of outtakes from that event. And so this is gradual. This is where we are today in the world of autonomous robots. This robot is designed not to fall over. <laughs> and, you know, we've got 24 teams. They've been given uh, almost two years. They've been given millions of dollars of each. And the machines are largely teleoperated. And most of them fail. Um, as a matter of fact, the son of Gil Pratt, who was the, uh, the DARPA roboticist who was in charge of this contest after seeing this, um, said, you know, if you're, if you're afraid of the Terminator, all you need to do is keep your door closed. Because the robots <laughs> still are not at the point that they can open doors. I mean, I think this is, this is really a, a, a 
good corrective to sort of where we believe we are in watching you know, <laughs> Ex Machina or Terminator or Chappie or any of the other movies that suggest that we're, we're um, these are very, very hard problems. And there's a reason to think that we're making, we're making real progress, but it's not going to be overnight. And, you know, I like to tell people, um, this is a bet, a bet that I've been placing on, I'm sure I'll get caught for this, but what I've been saying is, um, if you were able to send an Uber robot to my house in San Francisco in 2025, and it will take me here in Palo Alto in the evening for dinner, I'm buying dinner. So that's where I think we are, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a while, but I just wanted to say a, a little bit more about the, the jobs issue, because um, I was involved, I think, in part in creating this, uh, this discussion, and you know, there's, there's periodically in American society, we, we get really alarmed about the possibility of technological obsolescence. And we're back in that period now. There was a period in the early 1950s, there was a period in the early 1960s, and we're at that juncture again. This is Norbert Wiener, who basically invented the term cybernetics in the late 1940s, and he began worrying about automation and computing. And in 1951, he wrote another book called The Human Use of Human Beings. And, and Wiener made a real effort to contact the labor movement and raise this issue. And, uh, and you know, at that point, uh, we entered the Eisenhower era and it dropped off the MAPA as an issue for almost a decade, came up again in the Kennedy administration and dropped off the, 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 uh, the screen again. We're back. Um, in 2010, this is an article I wrote about uh, the legal profession. I began seeing uh, technologies that would displace $35 an hour uh, paralegals and $400 an hour attorneys uh, and do a demonstrably better job of reading documents than, than humans. And it really is, those technologies have changed, have begun to change the legal profession. It's also happening in radiology. You're getting these programs that are able to do perception, do machine vision, they're having a big impact. And so um, there's been a wave of concern, um, and, and with some reason, because the workforce clearly has changed in the United States over the last half decade. Um, there's been real concern about sort of the shrinking of the American working class and the danger of polarizing our, 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 our labor force into an elite and uh, you know, a, a sort of a low paid movement proletariat. Um, but the fact is that right now in America, there are 140 million people working, more people than have ever worked in America in history. And, and so people, when you say that, say, ah, but the labor uh, participation rate is down. Workforce participation, the percentage, and you know, then when you start to pick that apart and say, what part does technology play in these labor changes? You, you run into this real problem because it turns out that the dominant factor in the decline in labor, labor force participation rate, is people like me. Um, it's my generation, the baby boomers, have moved through the workforce and they're now exiting the workforce, and that's that's probably the, the, the largest factor. Um, so I've been trying to pick apart a very nuanced. Um, a very nuanced sort of discussion about, about the labor force. In 2012, I spent a half a year trying to get into China. And because uh, my employer is having a little squabble with the Chinese government, I ultimately couldn't get a visa, a working journalist visa, to go to China. And so I went to the Netherlands instead and discovered this factory, which was built by the Philips Corporation, um, to automate the production of their uh, high-end shavers. Uh, electric shaver is arguably a more complex uh, product to assemble than a cell phone, smartphone, uh, more parts, um, more manual. And these are 128 uh, uh, adept uh, robot arms. Adept is a company that's across the uh, across the bay um, that work at two second intervals and can make 15 million uh, shavers a year. Um, the only humans on the line, and they do re they do just remarkably complex tasks at very precise intervals. Uh, the only humans on the line are eight women in white jackets who sit at the end of the line and do QA. And the way they do QA is they listen to the shavers because it turns out that's the best way to tell them if it's working correctly. Um, and the reason that this technology hasn't yet come to China is shaver models, well, smartphone models change about every nine months to a year. Shavers change about every half decade to a decade. So you can get the capital investment back that you put into the shaver line. But these machines are becoming much more programmable now. And you know, an example of this is another com company that Andy Ruder bought um, for Google, which was a, 
uh, two years ago, it was just south of San Antonio in Palo Alto, and it was an example of um, artificial intelligence, machine learning technology, and the falling cost of sensors. Uh, this is a company called Industrial Perception that now belongs to Google. And they took on the, the, sort of the task that they wanted to automate was loading and unloading Federal Express trucks. Uh, and you know, the economics of this situation is a human worker can move one box every six seconds. They weigh up to 70 pounds. Uh, the backs get hurt, they get higher. And these guys were fired by Google. They were able to move one box every four seconds. So it's clearly an area of the economy that's going to be eliminated. It's just, it's not that great of a job. Uh, and in, in the future, I think most warehouse tasks and the loading and unloading trips will be done by machines. So should we, how worried, and uh, you know, the sensor in this case is, is, is uh, a Kinect sensor, that device that allowed you to play games in the home uh, with uh, Microsoft Xbox. And what happened is in a very short period, machine vision, which had cost about $10,000 per application, fell to $100. And you get those kinds of changes, you can do things that you could never do before. Um, you have to be careful about uh, your predictions. This is a book written by, let's see if they will, by Jeremy Rickman, who's an economist who argued in 1995 that we were about to have no jobs. In the succeeding decade after that, the economy grew, grew more robustly than it had in history, 19% growth. So you have to be very careful. And, you know, I continue to pick things apart. Many of the books that have sort of raised the specter of this impending crisis have argued about this, this uh, situation where 13 programmers at Instagram, the books argue, in effect, displaced 140,000 workers at, at, at Kodak. You know, photo sharing, digital photo sharing, based on the internet, and chemical photography. And it's just wrong. Um, it's a much more complex situation, which you can think of, you know, do it as a thought experiment. First of all, um, Fuji, who was Kodak's competitor, made it across the chasm just fine. You know, the reason that Kodak died was not the internet. Kodak put a gun to his head and pulled the trigger a number of times until he was dead by making business mistakes. Furthermore, Instagram and its 13 programmers couldn't become the powerful service that it became until the modern internet emerged and how many jobs were created by the modern internet, probably more than two and a half million, many of them very good jobs, two and a half to three or four million. So, you know, picking in apart this thing, you run into a very different model. My, my view changed over the three or four years I've been reporting on this, mostly because of a conversation I had with Dan, uh, Danny Kahneman, the economist, behavioral economist. So I had my hair, hair on fire and I was making this argument about robots in China and arguing that, that they would be a disruptive force as they displaced um, manufacturing. And Kahneman said, um, you don't get it. In China, if we're lucky, the robots will come just in time. I said, excuse me, what do you mean? And he said, you know, it's a shrinking, uh, it's a shrinking population. And of course, we, you know, we know this now because they just changed the one-child policy. But nevertheless, the number of 19-year-olds in China is going to shrink by a third over the, next, over the next decade. I mean, it's really dramatically shrinking, as is Japan. And the whole world, in fact, is aging. The most dominant sort of force in the world shaping what the world is going to look like over the rest of the century is, is aging. Um, the number of people over 80 in the world at large by the middle of the century will double, and it will increase by sevenfold by um, the, end of, the end of the century. There are now, for the first time in history, right now in the world, more people who are over 65 than under five for the first time in history. That's the more important issue, and it's really you know, it's, it's it totally re reorganized the way I think about this. And so, if you saw this wonderful movie, Robot and Frank, the question is, will the elder care robots come in time for the aging population? And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's hit and miss. The technology is clearly improving. And I, you know, the question I go around asking, uh, asking roboticists is, when will a robot be able to give a human a shower? And we're at the moment, at this moment, we're a long way away from that. Now, there are many things you can do that are useful that, that are in between on the way to, to that kind of care. Just being able to instrument a house so somebody can age in place longer is a big deal, and that, that kind of stuff is happening. The other thing I think we, we, we should really watch carefully, if I can go back. So, you know, Watson got a tremendous amount of, uh, uh, IBM got a tremendous amount of publicity out of the Watson program, which was this program that played Jeopardy successfully. What was not sort of known about the actual event of Jeopardy 
is that part of the deal was the Watson actually pressed the button too, just like the humans, and that was a mechanical robotic device that was statistically controlled. And it turns out if you look at that level of jeopardy, he, I forget their names, but everybody knows the answer. And if the person who wins is the person who presses in most precisely, and Watson pressed in with just, you know, it had a statistical algorithm that got it in ahead of the humans all the time. So it's not quite the same thing as a, as a thinking machine. But IBM is now commercializing Watson. They took out an eight page advertisement from the New York Times, thank you, a couple of weeks ago. And, and uh, it's being commercialized as a series of AI services doing things like speech synthesis and speech recognition. And I'm fascinated to see what conversational systems do to the, the economy, because that's one of the places where the middle class has grown most strongly. People who answer questions over the, over the phone. Salespeople, technical support people. And you know, this is the next, the next way. Um, IBM told me a couple of weeks ago that they've actually dumbed down the speech synthesis technology in Watson because it sounds too human. And they didn't want people to feel that they were talking to a human when they weren't. So it's, we're, we're at that point already. And so you might, you know, look at those, many of those jobs have already left the country in the form of outsourcing of call centers to, to the Philippines and, and India. And now we have this ironic sort of note of the jobs coming back to the US, but they're coming back as software and data center driven as human beings. Um, you know, that's happening all over the economy. Jobs are beginning to tri trickle back for a lot of reasons. I visited a, a solar panel manufacturing uh, operation in Fremont, and on the wall, there was this big sign uh, because Governor Brown had visited there with a brand new automated manufacturing plant said, green jobs and technology, bring jobs back to California, bring jobs and something else back to business and jobs back to California. And I counted the number of people on the line, there were nine people. Now it ran, it ran 24 hours, there were three shifts, but there were still only nine people. It wasn't bringing a lot of jobs back. So there's other things that we should look at in terms of the dark side of this technology. And uh, to my point about self-driving cars being as much as a decade away, I know probably all saw that Tesla has begun to market this feature for the S that they call self-driving autopilot. Um, and if you go to Google now and Google the phrase Tesla swerves, you will see very many interesting videos, including this one. Um, whoops, let's go back, sorry. It's doing something that it wasn't supposed to do. Um, I, you know, the technology largely comes from an Israeli camera maker uh, uh, called Mobileye. And Mobileye is in many of, of you know, modern vehicles. It's in Volvos, it's in uh, Audis, Mercedes, uh, GM cars. And it has the lane keeping technology, but it's lane keeping technology. It's not a complete perception of model of the environment. And so I'm worried that uh, Elon's experiment is basically this alpha test with his, with his user base. And if one, you know, one bad crash, you can set autonomous driving back for, for a decade. There are some other good signs about the limits of automation. I mean, here we've had this wave of new automation technology. Recently, Toyota's done a number of interesting things. And one of the things is last year, they began putting workers back on manufacturing lines. And the reason was, is even though they had these really quite perfect lines that had very high quality production operations, once you built the line, it didn't improve itself. The machines are not self-evolving, they're not gonna be evolving anytime soon. And so they put humans back into the loop to find out ways they can improve the production process, which I thought was very interesting. The other thing that happened is about two months ago, Toyota came here to Stanford and gave the AI department $25 million and they went to MIT too and gave $25 million there too. And it was to build, to design, not self-driving cars, but to, to design intelligent cars, cars that would sort of wrap around you and make you a safer driver, but keep you in the loop. And it's a just sort of different philosophy about driving. It's interesting that that's the way they, they chose to approach it. Um, just sort of out of my reporting, there are a couple of things I wanted to end on, just sort of thoughts about where we are. Um, 
So we're at this point where these machines are really quite powerful. We have some choices in society of how we relate to these machines going forward. Um, Microsoft is running this fascinating experiment in, in China uh, with a chatbot now called Xiao Ice. It's a chatbot, you know, you typed it, it types to you. Unlike Siri and Cortana and Google Now, they're designed as productivity tools. You ask it something or tell it something, it gives you an answer, you go on about your day. Um, Xiao Ice is designed to have a conversation with someone. Uh, and on, on mobile phones in that world, it's become extremely popular. There are 20 million users, 10 million are intense users who have multiple conversations, up to 60 a day with this machine. They call it toilet time. The kids go into the bathrooms and at 11 o'clock and interact with the, the programs. And it's 25% of them have typed I love you to Zhao Ice. This is right out of the movie Her, from our American sensibility. 50% um, have said thank you. Uh, the way they've sort of improved over most chatbots, I mean, if you play with most of the chatbots you've seen in, in our culture, um, they're like dancing dogs. It's impressive that they get boring very quickly. But Microsoft strip mined the entire Chinese social web. And so they got these question answer pairs that made it much more likely that if you sit and type something to the machine, the machine would type something back to you that would be compelling. And it turns out that, you know, they, and so I talked to the Microsoft researchers who were involved in designing this at Redmond. They were even freaked out a little bit by what was happening and the level of, of interaction. And of course, Sherry Turkel at MIT has just published this book about reclaiming conversation and the value of face-to-face -face conversation. You get this image of a her-like society where all of our conversations are with proxies. And I talked to this IBM researcher who's Chinese, and she said, you know, when we come to your country, it feels socially quiet. She had a very different perspective. She said that, um, uh, we come to your country and feel socially quiet. When we're in China, we're engaged with people all day, and she sees this as people having private space, as having time to learn with their thoughts, which is a very different sort of culturally relevant way of framing this. Um, so, you know, when I walk down the street in San Francisco these days, um, uh, everybody is walking around looking at the palm of their hand. Everybody is sort of taking their, their life instruction from the palm of their hand, and I just sort of feel like that can't be the end of human interface. And there is one direction I think that's interesting. Um, this is a company uh, called Magic Leap, a video they put up on the web. And I was very skeptical about augmented reality, the notion that you might actually, all the keyboards and the things that we use to interact with our computers might go away, and you might have a different way of interacting with the machine. And this is their video, um, which I thought was pure science fiction. Um, they have this up on the until I went to Florida, and I actually saw the technology. And I would have thought that that was science fiction, except that I saw, I saw something that was that compelling. The technology they have, which, uh, which writes on your eyeball with a laser beam, so what could possibly go wrong? But um, it basically recreates the analog light field that we have all around in the digital light field, and they are at the limit of, the, of, of human vision. So they, I, the, the, the demo I saw was as real as seeing someone sitting there, which I had never seen before. So I thought, well, that, you know, that might be possible. What they hadn't done is miniaturized it yet. So, uh, you know, I, I, my friend Paul Sappo was a longtime Silicon Valley pundit, you know, never mistake a clear view for a short distance. So that is a technology direction that I'm kind of compelled by. Um, one other very last thing here. So, uh, you know, when I, when I use the phrase loving grace, what, sort of what do you mean by grace is I guess the question I would pose. Because we talk about cyborgs, and you know, the Borg is this term that sort of, sort of emerged into this uh, Star Trek kind of notion of um, this sort of sentient creature, you know, resistance is futile, you will be assimilated. And I, I, I actually worry about um, the interconnectivity that's surrounding us, that sort of wrapping around us and giving us sort of all of our life instructions. We have a generation now who basically takes life instructions from what barbecue to get to who to marry from some algorithm in the cloud. And you know, so as you get toward this notion of cyborg, which actually binds that, that computational uh, capability very tightly with humans, I worry about the, the, um, the possibility of losing humanity. But at this point, we're not there. Um, this was uh, Norbert Wiener at the very beginning. And the point is that we, that we still have a choice. The machines are not evolving. And it's a, a very human choice about designing ourselves into or out of the future. So thank you very much.
So yeah, if anybody has any comments, questions, yes. Uh, didn't Wiener also write the book God and Gold? He did, at the very end of his life. Uh, it was kind of a, a, a meditative. So cybernetics, I've been very interested in, in cybernetics, and one of the things I, I didn't talk about here is that uh, when McCarthy coined the term artificial intelligence in 1956, it turns out that the reason he came up with the term artificial intelligence is that he hated Wiener. It was a personal vendetta. He wanted nothing to do with discussing anything with Wiener, who he thought was, he thought was bombastic and a boor, and he also thought cybernetics was too analog. He wanted something that was digital, and artificial intelligence uh, was proposed. But I think, in some ways, cybernetics as a as a as a perspective was actually a more appropriate way of sort of looking at the world. It was the science of the study of communications and control in animals and, and humans, and it sort of fell out of favor in the U.S. But you know, it it, it maintained a following in Europe, and actually now. There's an effort at the Media Lab uh, at, at MIT to bring back a sort of cybernetic science that draws together biological and, and computing elements. So. Well, he was writing the report that meant gun control for anti-aircraft. <laughs> that's kind of where it came. Gov cyber is Greek for governor, of course. Yeah. But yeah. you know the, what the point of the story got in goal? I've forgotten it. Well, the, the elevator explanation is the Jews of Prague to do in the ghetto to protect themselves to invent the golem, which is sort of this big protector and automaton of sort, which ends up impressing them. So, you know, the, 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 yeah, unfortunately, you got to be a little bit careful about what you want. Well, yeah, it's Frankenstein myths have been with us for, forever. Yeah. I mean, the golem, the golem analogy is this really spooky one. I mean, even the golem, you had to place this piece of paper in it to program yeah. it. It was a little bit like a, a you know a program, a software program. The, the yeah. analogies are really well, it's kind of like Frankenstein without the personality. Yeah. <laughs> so that, I mean, that's the analogy. Yeah. Where he was even worried about that. Yeah. Wiener was impressive. There's one in the one in the front. I <clears throat> I was just wondering. Um, from what you've been looking at, do you think there are capacities or, or skills, abilities that humans have that robots and machines sort of are fundamentally incapable of emulating or, or copying? So, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've read and reported a lot on this subject. Um, David Otter is one of the people I think most highly of, who's a labor economist at MIT, and he's written this wonderful piece called Why Are There Still So Many Jobs? Uh, uh, and one of the things he brings up is the, sort of the thinking of a French uh, philosopher, Michael Pogliani. And uh, uh, Pogliani basically says that um, we, uh, we know more than we can tell. And he argues that there is a, a, an aspect of human knowledge that cannot be codified. And if you can't codify it, you can't compute it. And so he defines that as the limits of automation. And you know, that's, that's kind of compelling. And then I go over to UC Berkeley and I talk to some of the people who are working on deep, deep learning, deep belief nets, and they're very optimistic. They're extremely optimistic about how far they can push this biologically inspired technology, which right now is doing perception pretty well, not, not at human levels, but is doing made vast improvements in perception, but it's not doing cognition so well. So, uh, you know, until I, you know, my, my sort of rule of thumb is, until it's in fries, it's not real. <laughs> and, and, you know, this sort of the assertions that this community makes, and, they, and you know, Kurzweil, um, um, uh, you know, who's the, uh, Jeff Hawkins, um, Bill Atkinson, who's one of the Mac team, are people who argue that we understand the basic mechanism, biological mechanism of cognition in the cortex, and it's simply a matter of scaling it up. And when I talk to neuroscientists, they say, you know, we have hardly have a clue. And I sort of am in that camp at this point. So, so let me uh, ask the opposite question. What can machines do way, way better than we can? Or what do you preview that we will be able to do? You know, well, so, um, what can they do? Well, so, um, they're beginning to, I mean, God, it's, it, the list is so long. <laughs> the list is so profound. I mean, uh, you know, anything that's based on calculation, uh, uh, but the, what they can do, so I'm, 
in, in these new areas of computing, like machine vision and language understanding, um, the combination of these algorithms, which have actually been around for a while, coupled to the big data sets that the internet makes it very easily to accumulate and increasing computer power, has led to this really rapid increase. And where, you know, AI as a field uh, over-promised and under-delivered for decades, and now for the first time, things are different. And they're on this remarkable rate of progress. And as I said, uh, you know, with the caveat that they're doing really well on perception. However, if you go over to Berkeley now, they're using deep learning techniques and they're teaching robots how to do dexterous grasping using that, that basic uh, uh, you know, machine learning approach, which suggests that it might have a much broader sort of applicability. And so then speed becomes, because the computers can, can, you know, can, can, can iterate so many times so quickly, then you can, you can do things that are actually useful. I, you know, I, everywhere I go, I see an example of computing that's, that's you know, that's having a big impact on the world. I can't, you know, I can't begin to enumerate it. Just, it's too broad. I have a, I have a question. Um, if you look in the uh, second window over there on my office, you'll see the shell of a Parrot drone that uh, Pally Voice bought a few years ago for $300 around campus. Uh, then we got another drone and flew that around, and now our interpretation of the law is that um, that organizations such as a student group are not, uh, that it's not okay for, it's not legal for us to fly it around anymore. So I'm, I'm curious about uh, whether you think, what, how long will it take before we get that back? Because yeah. people are going to be driving cars around. How well, this is, this is going to be one of these uh, social, uh, society, societal flashpoints. Um, you know, so there are people at NASA Ames right now working on air traffic control systems for a world in which they describe as that the sky is dark with drones. And they have a very broad view of that uh, airspace up to 400 feet. You know, the air traffic control now is 400 feet and above, and now they're starting to think about controlling vehicles flying at 400 feet below. I interviewed a roboticist at uh, the University of Illinois uh, last week who has got a one and a half million dollar grant to design uh, drones for indoor flight for drug delivery uh, inside the home. As, as odd as that may seem, there are people who are working on that kind of issue. So I think technically over the next half decade, it's going to be feasible to do these things, to be to do practical things with drones. I mean, they're already around urban areas. They're doing commercial things. Uh, they're being used in warfare. And uh, uh, I don't think the, the issue is technology. I think that's going to come very quickly. Uh, th there was an MIT press release today about uh, sort of basically giving drones uh, sort of a Star Wars navigation capability through dense forests to be able to autonomously fly through very, you know, lots and lots of obstacles with, with ease. Uh, so that part's, that part's done. The question is, do we want our society to be one in which we're surrounded by flying things? And I think we'll have, you know, look what happened um, with just people wearing uh, Google Glass in San Francisco and what, what a crisis it created. I mean, there were, you know, there were fights over it. And I, I think the people who commercially fly drones are gonna have to take care of, you know, have to face anti-aircraft fire from random backyards. I think that I, there, there will be real opposition to, to routine drone flights over, over urban areas. It will be a problem. An equally powerful law in Moore's law is Murphy's law, which you haven't mentioned here, but I think that is going to be a limiting factor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Hi. Uh, in the context of self driving cars, um, we face a point where cars have to make ethical decisions. And uh, I had this conversation with my dad where uh, you have a hypothetical situation where a car is seeing that there is a family and is trying to save the family. And at what point the, the car is going to decide to kill the family or to kill you? Yeah. Yeah. It's called the trolley problem. Exactly. It's a famous philosophical problem, which is, uh, I would argue, imponderable because let's, let, I have a friend who likes to, to frame the trolley problem. What if? Because you know, that's obviously the rational thing is to, to mow, mow down the one person rather than the five people, right? Okay, so uh, 
But what if on the left side it's Gandhi and on the right side it's Hitler and Goebbels? Then what do you do? I mean, these are wonderful problems. I, you know, I sort of come down on the end, on the side of the autonomous vehicle community. Increasingly, we're such bad drivers that the bar is pretty low. And so even if every once in a while the machine makes an ethical mistake, overall, driving will be much safer. And, you know, writ large, the number of lives will be saved and will be better for society as a whole. I mean, that's the simple way, to my mind, out of that, you know, imponderable. So, thank you. Any more questions? I'll ask uh, one last one, put it that way. And my interest is that of a, a journalism instructor. Um, uh, you've been, I'm assuming your relationship with your employer at the Times has changed over the years you're writing books now. I'm just curious, what, what is a daily life, what is daily life in communication for you? That's really interesting. So I've watched a number of transitions, and so the way I frame it is I've seen two transitions as, as a journalist. When I first came into the, to the field as a daily reporter in the 1980s, that was the first transition, transition point. And that, that transition was uh, before me, after work, reporters went to the bar. And I was the first generation where reporters went to the gym. So that was a cultural shift. Now I'm at another point. Uh, and I'm in the San Francisco Bureau of the New York Times, which is probably the last growing print bureau in the world. We now have almost 25 people in our bureau. When I came in 92, there were, there were three of us uh, and staff, four, four to include the stringer. And now I sit in the office and I'm surrounded by what I call kids. And they've got headphones on and they're writing code. And that's the future of journalism. It's not a noisy, you know, people aren't shouting over the phone. It's a very different culture. And, um, you know, I'm not really worried about autonomy. I mean, machines are starting to write stories. Uh, the AP and Forbes and others are all taking uh, machine-written stories and putting them on their website. And I have to tell you, so there are machines doing what I did as a cub reporter. They are writing quarter, quarterly earnings reports. And I think that's great. I work enough for quarterly earnings reports, but I have to never see a quarterly earnings report. I mean, you know, how many Apple earnings reports can you write in your lifetime? So the machine does, does that, they do a good job, that's, that's great. Although they're not, uh, you know, so, you know, some of this stuff is pretty straightforward. When I first was writing about artificial intelligence in like the mid 1980s, there was this wonderful demo that they did down at ISAI at USC, an AI research lab. Um, they took the wire feed and they, they fed it into this AI program and uh, they, they, they designed the program so if you turn the knob to the left, it would write left-wing editorials, and if you turn to the right, it would write right-wing right editorials. So how hard can that be? Um, so, uh, so, you know, the, obviously journalism is changing profoundly, and there are some things I consider um, to be negative. Like, we had a, 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 a really strong set of standards, which we most of the time adhere to, and I think now in modern American journalism, everything is up for grabs. Uh, and I worry about the way it's going to come down. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that newspapers as printed vehicles for the delivery of news going away. I mean, I think that's kind of inevitable. Um, however, there's one thing I, I do have to say about, about uh, this, this juncture we're at now, which I think of as sort of a bubble, although it's debated. But, you know, in terms of the news sites that you visit, remember that between 30 and 60% of the traffic going to those news sites are robots. There's software programs that are designed to arbitrage traffic. I mean, there is an incredible scam being run on the internet right now about, about the advertising model that is driving the growth of these websites. And I think at some point that will shake out. And then we'll see if the time strategy, which is about subscribers and actually paying humans, is going to be a workable strategy. But not right now, because you get this immense growth because you can buy traffic. Just not human traffic. So that's the kind of strange robot world. So thank you. Thank you. And we have the Mac boosters. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you.